Hi everyone, welcome back to Classic Movies with Ron McCluskey. Tonight our guest is Professor Paul Israel. He's from Rutgers University and he knows a lot about Thomas Edison and his life and his career and what he's been involved in. And tonight we've asked him here specifically to talk about the whole motion pi picture industry and how it got started. First of all, thank you sir. Welcome oh, to the show. My thank pleasure. You for coming. Glad to be here. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself if you can, your background and where you're from. Sure. Well, I actually grew up in California. I came okay. to New Jersey in 1980, um, actually for what I thought was going to be six months to work on Thomas Edison. Uh, there was a, uh, the Edison National Historical Park in West Orange, New Jersey, his laboratory there, commissioned a study of Edison's invention of the electric light, and I had just gotten a master's in public history at UC Santa Barbara, and came out for six months to be the research assistant, and uh, found him eminently interesting and um, just fascinated by the whole process of understanding what he had done and the Edison Papers project at Rutgers University, which was taking the papers to publish them, uh, was just getting started and so I joined the staff and then returned to school and got my PhD actually at Rutgers University and eventually became director of the project in 2002. Right. Tell me a little bit more about the Edison Papers. So what are these? Just letters from Thomas Edison or right. correspondence or what, what is it? It's just about anything you can imagine. So we have all of his notebooks. We have his personal correspondence, his business correspondence. Uh, we've collected a whole slew of different family papers from all over. Uh, we've got his business records, so all the companies that he established, all the businesses and industries that he founded. We've got all those records. Um, or we've got most of them. We don't have everything. There are times when we wish we had everything, but we don't. Um, so what we're doing is we're uh, publishing those in both a an image edition that began as microfilm, but we've been digitizing those records and putting them online. And then we have a book edition, which is about half done now, uh, beginning uh, with his birth in 1847, going through to his death in 1931, and we're at volume eight of 15. Uh, volume eight wow. will be finished this spring. Okay. And it, is there anything that stands out in your mind that you've learned or that you've discovered that maybe right. wasn't well, known I think before? the thing, there, some of the things we, we've discovered about Edison that I think are most interesting and important are the way in which he really did transform invention in the 19th century. At Menlo Park, here in Edison, he developed the first true research and development uh, laboratory for invention, for new technology, and then built the bigger lab in West Orange uh, later on, but it sort of began here in, uh, in Edison. And in, as part of that, he also kind of took invention and made it part of a larger process. So Edison didn't just invent in the laboratory, but he then figured out how to manufacture and take the technologies out into the marketplace. And right. he did all of those things. And that's what sort of sets him apart from so many of his contemporaries. Well, let's back up a little bit and let's find out a little bit more about Thomas Alva Edison. He was born when and where did he grow up? Right, so he was born in Milan, Ohio in 1847. Uh, this was, today it's a, it's a little backwater. At the time, it had a canal uh, that transported more wheat than any place else except through Odessa, Russia. Wow. Uh, it was a real busy port city. And then the railroad came along and bypassed the town and it kind of fell by the wayside. So Edison and his family mo moved to Port Huron, Michigan. Uh, and this was a lumber uh, town uh, just across the river from uh, Canada. Uh, and Edison's parents had actually come from Canada. Uh, originally, the family had lived in the New York New Jersey region when they first came uh, in the colonial period and then after the Revolutionary War. Uh, they were loyalists, went up to Canada, and then the family found its way back to Michigan. So Edison, uh, born in uh, Milan, Ohio, grew up in Port Huron, Michigan, and then for about four years he traveled the Midwest and the Upper South as a telegraph operator during and immediately after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Then he goes to Boston for a few months, and then he comes to New York and he settles in New Jersey, in Newark, uh, for the first few years of his life, in part because New York was the center of finance, it was the center of the telegraph industry, uh, there was lots of manufacturing in New Jersey right across the river, 
and he could have the kind of resources he needed as an inventor here. Tell me a little bit more, though, about his family. What did his father do? Did he have brothers and sisters? Was he good at school? Right. I mean, what happened? Right. So Edison's uh, father, uh, Samuel, was sort of a jack of all trades. He did a number of things over the course of his life. Uh, his mother had taught some school. Um, so Edison himself had very little formal schooling. Um, we know that he went briefly to uh, a school run by a fellow named Reverend Angles when they first got to Port Huron. And there are two stories. Um, one is that uh, Edison was, uh, Edison's mother was told that he was addled, that he couldn't st uh, study properly, and she took him out of the school. Uh, but we have some correspondence from Angles that suggests that never happened. More likely, the family actually probably had some trouble financially and couldn't pay for the school. Oh. And then Edison later on, they set up a public school in Port Huron when he was about 12, and for a few months he attended the public school, which is also where he was introduced to his first science textbook, uh, Parker's Natural Philosophy. Right. Um, and then Edison went to work on uh, the train between Port Huron and Detroit, selling candy and newspapers and things like that. He had a chemical set on the train. He studied chemistry while he was on the train. He printed his own little newspaper, News Along the Line. Um, he was very entrepreneurial as a young man, something he probably learned from his father. He did have uh, older siblings. Um, uh, there were um, three uh, children that uh, survived and three that died. Uh, the two that survived were um, William Pitt um, and uh, uh, Tanny and then um, Edison himself. And, but he grew up more or less as, a, as an only child okay. uh, by the well, time that What was he, the age difference between There was significant age difference okay. uh, between them. And so the uh, other children were pretty much out of the house right. by the time. Okay. So then Edison how far did up. Edison get in schooling then? So he, he almost had none. He had wow. a, few, a few months around the age of seven and another few months around the age of 12. Mm -hmm. But what he did learn from his mother uh, was a great love of reading and learning through reading. And Edison read voraciously throughout his life. Um, and uh, we know that, for example, as a telegraph operator, uh, he would stop at the local, what were then called free libraries. Today we call them public libraries. Right. Um, but he also did that when he was on the train. Uh, when he went to Detroit, he would stop at the Young Men's Institute there, which had a library that he could right. use. We actually have his library card from that. Oh, terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. So then he leaves Ohio. He comes to the New York area. Right. So he comes to, to New York because, he, had, as I said, he'd been a telegraph operator in the Midwest. And then he'd gone to Boston to be an operator. And Boston is really a center of invention as well. And uh, so this is where he first begins to try to become an inventor, leaves his job as an operator. And amongst his inventions is this idea for sending two messages on a single wire, which other people were working on at the same time. And so he comes down to New York to test this on a line. He got permission to test it on a line uh, from Rochester to New York. And this is what brings him to New York. But once he was here, he realized, oh, New York's the commercial center. This is the place I really need to be. Right. So that's great. So it was the telegraph um, job that developed into something more and then brought him to New York and then he stepped. Right. But now he didn't have the means or the money at all to then set right. up his own. So what did he do from there as far as? Right. So what happens is that uh, Edison is working uh, particularly on a set of technologies known as printing telegraphy. We know them more commonly as stock tickers and related oh, okay. instruments okay. like that. And so Edison was making improvements in stock ticker technology uh, for a company called Golden Stock, which was the company that started the whole business. And Edison gets hooked up with Golden Stock. And his first contract with them actually uh, enables him to open up a little experimental shop so he can hire a machinist and have machinery so this machinist can help him develop the technology. In the 19th century, these were the laboratories, uh, machine shops where you had skilled machinists who could take an idea and turn it into a working instrument made out of wood and metal. And so this was crucial for Edison. And then he turns that into his first manufacturing shop and begins to sell the instruments that he's inventing and perfecting for Golden Stock. Uh, and so this is how Edison begins to develop both his reputation and the financial resources to be an inventor is through these agreements. And he does this in New York City or, or he goes to Newark, well, New Jersey by that he, time? he sets up his first shop in Newark because okay. uh, Newark is a, a major manufacturing center in the region uh, and it's right across the river from right. New York. So it's easy access to New York mm -hmm. where the companies and the capital is. 
uh, but Newark has the advantage of the manufacturing facilities right. and skilled machinists that he needs. And, and eventually what he does is he begins to combine right, this sort of shop invention with a laboratory. And that's because he goes to England and encounters a very scientifically oriented telegraph industry there. Uh, oh, people wow. like Sir William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, who was involved in developing the undersea cable telegraph systems. This was a physicist involved in the telegraph industry, and there were other people who had this sort of sophisticated background. And so Edison began to see the value in uh, developing a laboratory. People like uh, Kelvin had developed electrical measuring instruments mm -hmm. you couldn't get in the U.S. He begins to order those from Britain. And so he sets up his first small laboratory actually in a shop in Newark. And then when he moves to Menlo Park, he has this full-scale laboratory right. sets up. And about what age is he at this time? Is this before he's the age of 30? He right. So Edison okay. sets up the Menlo Park laboratory in 1876. He opens it up uh, late March, early April of 1876. He's 29 years old. Wow. And then from there, is there an actual way to track I mean, one invention came next, or what was oh, the yes, next? Oh, yes, very much so. So, so what was the progression? Right. Of so Edison had been working on telegraph technology okay. for the most part. And one of the telegraph technologies he's working on when he first comes to Menlo Park is what's known as acoustic telegraphy. This is a way of using tuning forks or vibrating reeds to send different tones or frequencies over the line. So you could send many messages, but they would be separated out by different right. frequencies. This is the basis for what becomes the telephone because Alexander Graham Bell and a guy named Alicia Gray were also working on this technology, and they begin to develop technology that becomes the telephone. And Edison himself later realized he had something that would have worked as a telephone as well. Wow. And so after Bell announces his telephone, and in 1876, there's a big centennial uh, exposition in Philadelphia for the 100th anniversary of the United States, and that's where he shows this publicly. It makes a big... Uh, uh, you know, it's given a big reception, and so people that have been to see this say it is to tell us, and they've got, this is what he's got to work on. Western Union wants him to work on it, and so he begins working on telephone technology okay. and develops an improved transmitter that actually makes the system more commercially viable. Okay. And Western Union owns that, and Bell owns the Bell system, and right. they compete against each other for a while. Okay. Uh, and then as Edison's working on that, he's thinking, um, well, you know, one of the things that you have to think about with the telephone is how you use it. And he comes out of the telegraph industry, so it's going to be operators talking to each other. But Edison's also interested in recording messages, so he begins to think about how to do that. And as a result, he develops something called the phonograph, the first way of recording and playing back sound. So in the summer of 1877, he begins working on this by the beginning of December. He has his first phonograph. He takes it into New York City again, right, to Scientific American offices, puts it on the desk of the editor, and it uh, introduces itself and causes a sensation. And that's what creates the Wizard of Menlo Park, is the phonograph. Oh, okay. It's so astounding to people. So, so that's before the light bulb? Before the light oh, bulb. Oh, wow, so the phonograph. So in, okay. in early 1878, Edison becomes the Wizard of Menlo Park because of this astounding invention, okay. um, the, now the it's, phonograph. When you first said uh, sound over a wire, I thought you were talking about the early developments of radio. No. But that came later. Right, and of course, radio is without the wire. That's wireless. Right, right, right exactly. Right. Okay, wow, that's interesting. So it was yeah. the phonograph. Okay, great. So now, phonograph, big, huge success. He thou becomes the wizard of, of Menlo Park. Now, in doing my research, I found a few people that were very, very important in um, how his interests got developed. And one of them is Edward uh, Moybridge. Moybridge. Mm -hmm. Great, I said it right. Right. <laughs> now, tell me a little bit about him and what he shows Edison right. is important. Right. So Moybridge comes to lecture in the spring of 1888, or February, I think it was 1880, actually, not long after Edison opens up his laboratory in West Orange. And um, Moybridge was lecturing about animal motion. Uh, he'd uh, gotten into studying this in part out of a bet that he'd made with Leland Stanford uh, about whether a horse's hooves all came off, off the ground at the same time as the horse ran. And he had figured out a way to make a series of rapid still pictures and then he developed this thing called the zoopraxiscope, where those pictures could be shown kind of revolving around and it looked like motion, so right. like motion pictures. And this kind of spurred Edison to think about, well, maybe there's a way to combine my phonograph with the zoopraxiscope and we can have talking pictures, opera, things like that. Right. And then later in the year, in October of 1888, Edison begins to think more about this particular problem and comes up with um, 
what he thinks is going to be the solution. The, he writes out a patent caveat, this sort of preliminary patent idea, in which he says he's going to do for the eye what the phonograph does for the ear. And he literally is thinking about the phonograph. He has a big cylinder, like his cylinder phonographs, but bigger, and he's going to put little micro photographs on it, and you would view it through an eyepiece. And as it revolved, you would have the impression of moving pictures. And so that's Edison's first idea for motion pictures. Right, and, and that is exactly what he did first, which right. then became the kinetoscope? No. No, no. okay, no. I'm sorry. And, and we actually have uh, W.K.L. Dixon, who is his primary assistant, right. who is also a photographer, it, in one of his notebooks, um, actually uh, uh, his notebooks and also in a guy named Charles Basher, we have pasted in some of these early little film strips that were made. And so there's actually one of these film strips that we can actually show. So uh, how, how did people view them? Right. So the idea was that you would view it through an eyepiece, sort of like a microscope eyepiece, okay. right? Um, but Edison soon changed his ideas about how he ought to do motion pictures. 1889, there was a big uh, international world's fair, the Paris Exposition, and Edison, who had only gone overseas once, that trip to England in 1873, right. decides he's going to go to the Paris Exposition. And he and Buffalo Bill are the big uh, celebrities. Uh, celebrities, right? Every, people are following them around, and his new improved wax cylinder phonograph is there, and um, Edison visits a number of different scientists living in Paris, including Etienne Marais, who is studying animal motion. And he'd come up with a slightly different way of doing it from Moybridge. He'd converted a sort of gun into a rapid-fire uh, film camera uh, with roll film. And that gave Edison the idea of using roll film uh, instead of these little micro photographs on a cylinder. And he came back and he began to work with Dixon and they figured out that they could move the film with sprockets. And the film they're developing is about an inch wide, so it's about 35 millimeter film. And so they begin to develop what becomes the first sort of modern motion picture uh, technology out of uh, that experience of his going to Paris and kind of rethinking what he's doing as well as continuing experiments that uh, Did Dixon he meet anyone else at that time or while he was there? Because I think I have some notes about him meeting uh, Marais? Yes. Well, Etienne Marais is the, is okay. the fellow that I had mentioned that was, right. was okay. doing the motion pictures right. of, okay. of animals. Mm -hmm. Great. And that's what I thought. Right. Um, if you've just joined us, this is Classic Movies with Ron McCluskey. My guest is Dr. Paul Israel. And we're looking at Thomas Edison and his involvement with the motion picture industry and how it became... Um, I think just as a side thing, maybe just some form of light amusement, I think so many people have been quoted by saying, this is not going anywhere. <laughs> and then, of course, it became a, a gigantic right. industry. So, uh, so he gets back home in 1891, then he patents. Right. So right. He, he and Dixon finally developed by 1891 a, a very high-quality movie camera called the Kinetograph. And they've also designed this thing called the Kinetoscope which is kind of a, a rectangular box with a continuous loop of film, and you kind of look through a peephole. It's right. a peephole kinetoscope, and right. that's how they think that people watch motion pictures. And they first exhibit this. Um, his wife is hosting a meeting of the uh, National Federation of Women, and so they actually bring them out uh, to the lab and demonstrate it to them. And so this is the first public demonstration uh, by Edison of his motion picture okay. technology. But, again, I just want to make sure people are clear on, on the chronological aspect here, but people are still viewing these things one at a time, That's right? right. They, one That's by right. one, a person right. goes up and looks, right. and, and it lasts, what, 20 seconds? Yeah, they're very short films. Right. They're not very okay. long at all. Right. In fact, the first one of the first films they show is Dixon just removing his cap as a kind right. of a greeting, right? And That's all right. that's going on. Uh, actually, the next public exhibition, which takes place in 1893, is of a scene of a of blacksmiths. They, by that time, um, Dixon had come up with the design for a movie studio. It doesn't look like a modern movie studio. Right. It's basically a big black box. It uh, looked a little like the paddy wagons in New York, which were called Black Mariah, so that's what it was nicknamed. And it's, it, it's all tar papered inside and out, but it has a roof that right. pulls up uh, so that the light can come in from the sun, the natural light, and they had it on a track so it could follow the light all day right. long. And so they, they set up a blacksmith scene. And in uh, 1893 in, in uh, Brooklyn, there's a lecture uh, given about motion pictures. This old praxiscope is talked about. And, 
then they showed this Edison picture. And that's actually projected in that particular case. It's one of the few Edison, early Edison films that was projected. On a big screen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. OK. But you also mentioned something to me, too, about that. There was also a experimental sound film. Yes. So okay. the, the uh, next year, actually, um, Dixon uh, takes a, a cylinder phonograph. And he plays the violin while two of the guys in the laboratory are dancing together. And so there's this film with this synchronized uh, soundtrack uh, of the dancers and, and the violin. And that's the earliest motion picture we have with the soundtrack. Right. Uh, Edison actually, for a brief period in 1895, actually marketed something called the kinetophone, uh, in which there was in the box both the kinetic scope showing motion pictures and also a cylinder phonograph with earplugs and you could listen to a recording while you were watching whatever the film was. It wasn't really synchronized, but you still had the a soundtrack with it. Okay. Explain to me more about uh, Dixon and his involvement with right. Edison and right. what he so, did. So Dixon is an interesting fellow. He had been uh, involved in the electrical industry. He'd been working for uh, Edison for a few years, it's about 1883, and uh, he's one of the people that, that's working in Edison's laboratory uh, at the lamp factory for a while in 1886. He has a lamp factory uh, laboratory, and then he moves to West Orange. And his primary work is actually on the ore milling project that Edison spends most of the 1890s on. Um, but this is a kind of side invention that Edison has him spending a little bit of time on with one of the machinists. And so they're busy doing uh, some experimental work. Uh, initially, they're actually doing it on the second floor of the lab, but the machinery there is always interfering with what they are doing, so Dixon actually has to build a separate little uh, small outbuilding for the, the photographic work on motion pictures. Right. And so uh, Dixon does a lot of this sort of day-to-day -day work, and if anybody could be considered a co-inventor of motion pictures with Edison, it would be Dixon. He right. very which, which, again, I'm sure is completely understandable because Edison's busy running his own company, right. uh, doing other experiments, doing other, uh, right. signing patents and doing things. You can only focus on so many things at so many times, but still, Edison's name is on the company and he still has to approve well, on Edison, what is going on. Uh, the, the thing about Edison is that after the way the laboratory worked, there were teams of inventors, mm -hmm. right? So Dixon was working on ore milling with some other people, he was working on uh, motion pictures with some other people, and Edison was kind of overseeing the whole thing. A lot of the sort of uh, start of the projects came out of things that Edison wanted them to do and from the standpoint of the people working in the laboratory they understood they were working on Edison's inventions. Um, and the patent law at that time is kind of complex in terms of when somebody is a co-inventor. Uh, there have been a lot of arguments, I think very good ones made, that in this case Dixon probably should have been right. on the patents and he wasn't. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Now let's talk about the Latham brothers. Mm -hmm. and this is again about the mid-1890s. Uh, so right. what happens with them, and how are they involved with Edison? Right. So in 1894, Edison finally is at the point where he can begin to commercialize this. And so he's going to sell the kinetoscopes and the films, and people will use them for exhibitions, set up parlors, or they'll be put into amusement uh, houses, or they'll be put into bars or train stations. Uh, the same thing was happening with the phonograph at the same time. Uh, there were these coin and slot photographs. You could go and listen to a musical recording through earphones. And so the idea was that there would be a similar sort of uh, showing of films with the uh, kinetoscope. The Latham brothers, Raff and Gammon, and others were involved in setting up these exhibition companies and buying uh, the um, kinetoscopes and the motion pictures from the Edison Company. Okay. And let's go back to what people were actually looking at at this right. time. They were looking at just ordinary things, right? right. So, some of these. So films? the the earliest f commercial films uh, were primarily um, pictures of vaudeville acts. Uh, the Buffalo Bill Wild West show was filmed in a number of different a aspects of it. Annie Oakley amongst them, um, and then there were uh, films of street scenes. Um, in fact, the the early Edison camera was electric, and so you actually needed power to run it, and so it was mostly confined to the Black Mariah, but in France, the Lumiere brothers figured out a hand crank photo, uh, excuse me, a motion picture camera that also projected, and that sort of changed the picture, and so other people began to develop. There's a guy named Paul, uh, Robert Paul in England who right. developed his uh, device like that, and so the Edison Company actually had to match them and come up with a portable camera, and you begin to see a lot of street scenes, right? right. Uh, on rushing trains or 
or um, just people walking on the street, or crashing waves, a light boat coming in saving people, things like right. this. Uh, it's really what, uh, what the film historians call uh, 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 actualities, excuse me, uh, which are just you know, sort of everyday scenes. Um, and then you get, get sort of newsreel sort of things. Uh, President McKinley at the uh, Buffalo Exposition. Uh, you get um, uh, shots from the Spanish-American War, both real footage and then recreated footage. So there was a rec recreation of the sinking of the Maine, for example. Oh, wow. um, and so they're, they're kind of early newsreels, right? right. This is, uh, you know, today we have TV. In those days, you could have gone and, uh, to a phonograph, excuse me, a kinetoscope parlor and, right. and watched. Uh, so something. McKinley then was the very first president? To first be president to be uh, okay. you know, filmed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I think you also talked about uh, a boxing match. Right. So actually, this is before the commercial films even. Um, uh, Edison brought uh, uh, Corbett and Courtney, two boxers, out to the laboratory and actually filmed them in the Black Mariah. Uh, and boxing matches were actually a highly popular thing. And so a lot of bars uh, had kinetoscopes where they could show these boxing matches, for example. Uh, and these, these were the early sporting events that were very popular at the time. So all this is going on in America. Mm -hmm. All this is going on with Thomas Edison. Right. And um, every once in a while, because again, with communications, you hear about things that are going on in Europe, but a lot of things are going on in Europe. Right. And just mention some of those people, in, in, like Lumiere, Milliers, and, and right. all those people. And right. what is going on there? And is it, I want to say, is it because of competition, or they just had their own little niche of what they wanted to do? Right. So motion pictures is one of those inventions that was ripe for the doing at the time. There were lots of people working on motion pictures. Edison happened to get there first commercially, but right behind him were the Lumiere brothers. Um, and in some respects with a better system. Um, it turned out the projection was the future, not the kinetoscope. Uh, the hand crank camera gave it more portability. This was really important early on. Uh, in England, uh, there was a fellow named Robert Paul who was working. There was another fellow, uh, William Fries Green. In, even earlier in France, there had been this guy uh, named uh, Le Prince who had actually come up with a um, motion picture print on paper system, and there's one small little surviving clip of that. Um, so motion pictures were in the air and people were working on them. And right behind Edison was Lumiere Brothers and their beginning of film production. When they first showed their first public uh, films, uh, their first public showing, amongst the audience was George Méliès, who actually approached them afterwards and said, I want to buy one of your machines. Méliès was this magi magician. He had his own theater. And he thought, oh, motion pictures would be wonderful. These are magical in their own way, right? Uh, they actually refused to sell them. So he actually got a, a machine from Paul in England and then designed his own and began to create really fantastic motion pictures. He's the guy who really invents a lot of the special effects of early motion pictures and really begins to shape storytelling and special effects photography and influences everybody else, including the people who work for, for Edison. Right. And again, just as a point of reference so people can, if they want to find more mm -hmm. about this gentleman, uh, Scorsese did a wonderful film a couple of years ago. And what was the name of that film? Hugo. And uh, in that film, Melies is an older gentleman who has this toy shop in the railway station. Nobody knows who he is anymore. This is many years later after his heyday. And the kids that are involved in the movie soon discover that here's this motion picture genius who created this incredible motion picture magic. And one of the things that Scorsese does beautifully is show how he did this and right. kind of recreates the whole thing. It's a really wonderful Great. film. And let's back up a little bit. Tell, tell me more about Lumiere and, and what they had to do. First of all, they're two brothers. Right. And they get into uh, making films. And they call their camera cinema. Cinematography. OK. Um, and right, where cinema comes from, right? And that's actually how the French refer to it as a cinema, right? OK, great. But what exactly did they contribute? What, what is it right. in their so, film industry? So, so their contributions are this. Um, one, they have a camera that's portable. And so the camera goes outside. With the Edison camera, it was stuck in the Black Mariah. Right. right? So that's really crucial, right, is going outside. And that's, that really helps motion pictures to open up. And the other thing they do is their camera turns into a projector. And so all of a sudden, instead of everybody individually looking at pictures, right, through a little peephole, all of a sudden you can project on a screen and have an audience, right, and share in motion pictures. And this, this becomes the future. 
And it becomes obvious to the people working in the Edison film business that that's the future. And so amongst the exhibitors are these guys, Raff and Gammon, who approach one of the American inventors of a projector, a guy named Thomas Hamann, who was uh, with Charles Jenkins had developed this thing called the, the Fantascope. And they approach him and they say, well, you know, everybody's waiting for Edison to invent his projector and then you're going to be out of luck because everybody will want the Edison machine. That was his reputation, right? right. And Armand agrees to sell out. And so uh, he sells to the Edison company and it becomes known as the Edison Vitascope. Now, the interesting thing about Edison is that Edison is both the individual and he's the collective. He's the company, right? right. And so in the public mind, it's always Edison the individual. Right. So anything that comes into the Edison world is named Edison right. whatever it is, in this case, the Vitascope. And so people believe that Edison invented projection, right. but in fact, he just took this device that had been invented by somebody else, and they used it um, first in the United States. Right. And again, it's not, uh, I mean, to me, it's not such a big thing that, okay, so he didn't really sit down and do this. But again, he has so many things going right. on. He's such a large company. Right. People are coming to him with right. other things. So they all make it a part right. of it, and, and, and it That's becomes right. a part and of so it. And right. so it's as, as with any business, he's trying to catch up with the, mo right. what the most recent thing is. And so that's what they right. do is they acquire the, the now, Vitascope. Uh, we are talking to Dr. Paul Israel from Rutgers University, and we're talking about Thomas Edison and his involvement with uh, the motion picture industry. And there are two great DVD sets that are sitting on the table here that Again, if you're interested, you may want to find out about getting these. One is called Edison, the Invention of the Movies, and I'm sure it's uh, available on Amazon and online. The other one is called George Millet's The First Wizard of Cinema, and there's just so much information here and so much facts. It's just, it's wonderful, wonderful things. Right. And let's One, pick one thing I should yeah, say about ahead. these, so, so the, uh, the Edison um, box set has interviews with a number of film historians, and I also am interviewed in this. Uh, so they give you a little bit of the, the history as well. And in Melies, there's this wonderful little documentary that uh, accompanies it as well. So you can learn more about the history Terrific. of these as well. Terrific. Let's go back to some of these things which I, I think is interesting, is that these mundane things became <laughs> the interest of, of people to look at. And what is called, I guess, the first movie kiss, right? And mm -hmm. again, this is, I guess, one of these things that have been shown a hundred times. Right. Now, who are these two people? What, what is right. going on so, here? So they brought a couple of Broadway actors, and there was this famous kiss that took place in a play, right. and, and they just reproduced it on camera. It doesn't last very long, right. but that's what these early films were. They were right. just these little snippets, right? So right. you'd bring a vaudeville dancer out, for example, she'd perform her dancer. Right. Sandow the Strongman would lift weights, and that's what the film was, right? Wow, okay. <laughs> and then what about the sneeze? Isn't there also a Right, thing? so uh, uh, Fred Ott, one of Edison's machinists, um, took a pinch of snuff, put up his nose, and sneezed, and that's what they filmed. <laughs> that, by the way, is the first motion picture ever copyrighted. And one of the reasons we have some of the early Edison motion pictures is because the way Edison copyrighted the pictures, you could copyright photographs. And so they copyrighted every single frame by printing on roll paper and depositing in the Library of Congress. And later on, people at the Library of Congress figured out how to convert it back into film. Oh, wow. And in fact, you can go on the Library of Congress website and see a whole bunch of Edison films, these oh, early terrific. Edison films. Terrific. Now, speaking of Edison, Edison himself was in a, in a, That's a right. short movie, right? Now, what, right. what happened there? So there are two movies about Edison. One is an artist sketching a kind of cartoon of Edison. You never see Edison himself. Okay. But uh, later on, they brought Edison into the Black Mariah. They set up a little chemical table there, and he's they're conducting an experiment. Right. So you have this film of Edison in his laboratory. Right. Now, this is long before, I'm guessing here, I'm just throwing this at you, long before subtitles or anything, right? So, so, so no one had thought... Right. That if Edison said, hi, I'm Thomas Edison, to then show a car. Right. That, so, that comes a little later. Okay, a little as bit they later. begin to tell stories, right? right. And you okay. need to have some way. You don't have dialogue, right. right? Because there's no speaking. Right. So they had to have dialogue. So you right. should begin to get story films, right? So late 90s, turn of the century, you begin to get the evolution of story films. The original ones are very short. They're just right. little skits. Right. But increasingly, you begin to get longer and longer films. And Melies in... Uh, France is the one that's kind of leading the way in a lot of these early uh, storytelling uh, films. And then people in the U.S. are seeing what Meliès is doing, and they're beginning to copy him. 
And around 1903 is when you really, 1902, 1903 is really when you get the, a burst of much longer sort of story films and people beginning to try and figure out storytelling techniques, all the sorts of camera right. techniques that you have, uh, close-ups, um, uh, dissolves, fades, things like that. Right. Um, how you tell the story, right, mm -hmm. that's taking place in two different places at once. Right. Uh, there's this wonderful film, Life of American Fireman, that Edwin Porter becomes the main filmmaker for Edison, shoots in uh, 1902, early 1903, in which you see all the action take place from one perspective and then the exact same action but from the other perspective, first right. from the fireman and then from the person being saved. Later on, you get films like The Great Train Robbery, the same year, 1903, yeah. but there you have a much more uh, modern sort of storytelling technique. Okay, let's take a look at The Great Train Robbery, and again, because it's so famous, because it's been um, quoted over and over again, it's probably the first uh, full-length telling of a story. It has some wonderful shots. Um, in fact, was some of this shot in the woods of New Jersey? Yes, it was. Okay, mm -hmm. and then of course there's that famous scene where the um, one bad guy points the gun right, to the audience right. and shoots. Well, later on, I think it was the movie's called The Gray Fox, uh, where it's, it's supposed to take place around the turn of the century, and this former uh, outlaw is sitting in, in a uh, movie audience, and all of a sudden this fellow comes out with a gun and shoots, and, right. and he and everybody else is just shocked by it. And, and right. there, there were these stories. For example, there's a, there's a famous uh, film of a train kind of coming around a track and it looks like it's coming straight toward the audience before it finally curves away and apparently people were quite startled by this. Right. Uh, uh, let me ask you something else and again because I just thought of this when you talked about the train and then earlier when you talked about the hand crank mm -hmm. um, camera. Was it an accident or did they also discover that as they crank that film through the camera they can make things go fast or go slow and add that to the storytelling. Would, right. Did that well, I happen think as well? I, you know, I, a lot of these are people just kind of experimenting. Let's right. see what happens if we do this or right. that or the other thing. And so that's what happens in this early period. People are kind of playing with this new technology and figuring out what, not just how to use it, but also what it's good for. Edison right. himself didn't know. Right. When he invents motion pictures, he thinks, well, it'll be, you know, kind of sentimental. It'll be nice to be able to, you know, say, see an opera or something like that. Um, but he doesn't really know what, what it's going to be. And if you look at what those early films are, nobody quite knows what to do with this. So they think, oh, let's just take the f camera out, point it at something, and shoot it, right? And then you get people saying, well, you know, we could tell a story, right? And then as they begin to tell stories, they figure out different techniques to make those stories more dramatic, right, or funny. Uh, you begin to get, you know, different kinds of, of techniques, not just of the technical side of the motion pictures, but also from the acting in the art side as well, and that's really where it begins to take off. Uh, let's go back in the uh, order of what was important in, mm -hmm. in making movies, and I think this is interesting to note. To me, it was the original people that made the equipment. Then it became the people that, that put things together, and then it became directors and writers, and I think stars <laughs> were like almost the last thing to be right. discovered right. as important. So let's talk about Edwin as Porter. So. Porter has a theatrical background and then comes to work for Edison as a film director? Well, he actually has a, a more of a technical background. He, okay. he gets involved in the electrical industry, and then he goes to work at the Edison Musée in um, New York, which was a kind of a, a, a exhibition place and um, a theater. And he's the guy who's building and operating the sound, uh, excuse me, the motion picture projection equipment that they have. And that's sort of how he gets into motion pictures and gets him interested in the subject. And then he eventually becomes part of the uh, Edison uh, motion picture uh, business um, and uh, right around 1900. And he becomes the primary filmmaker for Edison. Okay. And he's the guy that sort of pushes them more towards story pictures right. and away from some of the more... Um, you know, street scene sort of uh, filming that they'd been doing up to that point. Right. So you were talking about the life of an American fireman right. and how important that was. Right. And yet again, just to put it in perspective, how long are we dealing with? How long did that film run? Because didn't they run just, as they say, just one reel, which is what? Yes, all, all the, yeah. So, yeah, most films in this period, um, when you begin to get the storytelling films, are about a reel, so about 10, 10 to right. 12 minutes usually. Right. And, and you get a few films that are a little longer. 
but it's really in the teens that you begin to get the much longer okay. films. And the so even The Great Train Robbery, it's is, only one right, reel. Right, it's a very short okay. film. But it um, does do some things different that had yeah. not been done before and uh, yeah. really is groundbreaking because everyone knows about this. Yeah. And I, think, I think it may be more than one reel. I'm trying to remember now. But, okay. it, 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 but nonetheless, it's still a relatively short okay. uh, film. But the important part is that Porter is the one that's right. behind that, that makes that happen. Right. Okay. Right. Now let's and, talk and he's influenced, as I say, by, by Melies and, and, right. the, and the French uh, industry that's beginning to do more of this sort of storytelling as well. Well, well that's, that's interesting, too, when you talk about uh, what's going on in Europe. So I assume then these films are not only being talked about and being put in news, but then they're coming over here, well, right? Well, and in fact, one of the things the Edison Company is doing is actually taking the French films, uh, uh, cutting in new intertitles, right, with, um, with English right. rather than okay. French, and showing the films, okay. right? And so this duping of the foreign films is an important part of the business. And in fact, when the Pathé Company comes in 1904 and sets up their business in New York, uh, this actually cuts into the Edison Company because all of a sudden they don't have all these foreign films they can right. show. Right, and of course this is long before movie palaces. Right. The, right. And, uh, right. So are they being shown in storefronts? And right. And so their storefronts, their amusement uh, 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 businesses. So you go in and there's all sorts of mechanical machines right. for entertaining yourself, including uh, kinetoscopes, right, or the biograph machine. Um, uh, they're shown in. They, they're in bars. They're in railway stations. Um, but in 1905, you begin to get um, the first real uh, places that are designed as motion picture um, palaces, right. Uh, right? And they're they're pretty small. They're they're again mostly storefronts. But now you got an audience sitting watching a movie, okay. right? And so for the first time, you really begin to get the growth of the motion picture business. And within a few years, there are 10,000 of these throughout right. the U.S. The first one's in Pittsburgh in 1905. Within right. about three years, there's about 10,000. Right. New York has dozens of movie theaters. A lot of them were actually in the immigrant communities. This was a nickel. It was a Nickelodeon is what right. it was called, right? It wasn't very expensive. You could go to the movies and have this glorious entertainment, right? right. And, and the other thing, too, that... Um, People, I think, seem to forget they were silent, so they appealed to all right. different, it, they, the young, they, the old, right. and no matter what language you spoke. Right. They were silent, but increasingly there was a soundtrack associated with them, okay. music. So there were organs in a right. lot of these, especially the palaces that get built in the 20s that mm -hmm. have these grand organs, but early on, you know, pianos and other things. Right. So uh, from early on, there is there is sound associated with them. In fact, some of the earliest uh, showing of motion pictures were actually in lecture halls. And uh, so they were just part of a lecture, actually. And there'd right. be travel logs, and there'd be a showing of a film, a slideshow, all sorts of right. things. So there, there are, there's a long history of sound with motion but, pictures. But I think we're also skipping one period where it wasn't so popular. Right. And, and again, this is what I was told that during vaudeville, once the acts were over, they would put on a movie to get the right. people That's right. <laughs> to leave. So because people didn't want to take a look right. at a movie, they wanted to see a right. live performance, and that was not too much earlier. Correct? Right. Right. Well, in the late '90s, right around the turn of the century, um, motion pictures were beginning to come passe yeah. because they weren't very interesting. Right? right. Okay. So I've seen a train. Here's another train. You know, I've seen crashing waves. I've seen a street scene. You know, show me something more interesting right. and. And it isn't really until you begin to get the growth of this sort of storytelling nature of motion pictures that people have a reason to want to come back and see right. the next film, right? And so it's this growth of the sort of storytelling art in the first uh, few years of the 20th century that spurs this growth of the Nickelodeons, right? Uh, thousands of movie palaces and thousands of films being shown all over the country. Right? Right. Now, besides Edison being so important in the growth of motion pictures, we also have a place that's important, and that is Fort Lee. Now, what happened with Fort Lee, and who was attracted, and what happened there right. in the early well, 20th century? New Jersey, of course, is where motion pictures in the U.S. started, at the Edison Lab and filming in the area around the, the Edison Lab. Uh, but uh, around 1907, 1908, people realized that if we're doing storytelling, we need you know, we can't keep showing people the same places over and over again. And Fort Lee had some advantages to be able to sort of represent other places. The Palisades, right, could represent cliffs in various places. Um, 
the, the town of Fort Lee itself became uh, part of the movie industry, and there are lots of films that were done around the town of Fort Lee where different uh, buildings were used and the streets themselves. And so Fort Lee had the scenery, it had uh, proximity to actors from Broadway, um, to the capital uh, that was available from investors in New York. And so a lot of studios begin to get set up in Fort Lee, and some of those that later became famous out in California, Fox and Goldwyn, um, Universal Studios begins there. D.W. Griffith gets his start there. In fact, his start was actually, he was an actor in an Edison film that was filmed in 1907 at the Palisades. And then later on, he filmed uh, uh, famous actors. Uh, amongst the actors he used was Max Sennett, who went on to develop his own studio in the Keystone Cops, a very famous series of, of comic films. Uh, the Gish sisters uh, became famous uh, actresses working for D.W. Griffith. They got their start in Fort Lee. Um, so Fort Lee was really the first center of movie making, beginning around 1907, 1908, and going through the teens. Right. And then it began to fall off. In the meantime, around 1912, Hollywood began to emerge. And Hollywood had one real advantage over Fort Lee. The sun shines a lot more in California than it does in New Jersey. And that was the big reason. There were three main reasons. The sun, cheap land, and the other thing you have in uh, the LA area is that within about two hours, you can get to mountains and snow, you can get to the beach, you can get to the desert. So you can, just about any kind of geography that you wanted, you could get to from Hollywood with no trouble. Right. And so there were real advantages to Hollywood, and that's why it becomes the motion picture capital of the world. Um, let's get back to Fort Lee, though, a little bit more, because, I, again, I think it's wonderful. So many people were around this time period. That's right. So much creativity was happening. And yet I think I just read recently that there's only, I think, one part of one building left in Fort Lee. Right. That was the original, well, we keep calling it Universal, but it wasn't Universal, but Carl Lemley had his studio there and made films. And that's it, right? I, yeah. There's no, nothing yeah. else that yeah. exists. No, that there, there's a about? Fort Lee Film Commission, and they're very okay. proud of the history, but there isn't much left of what was there except in the film, right? right. And so that's where you see the Right. But Israeli major, industry. major people come. That's um, right. During this period, and again, D.W. Griffith, again, is so important to the film industry. That's right. And I read a biography about uh, him about six or eight months ago. And it's so interesting that it was really the film director that really told the story. That's right. There were no actors, there were no trailers, there were no, you know, people with demands. It was the, the s telling the story. Well, telling the story, and Griffith was right. brilliant at it. And one of the things that you see as you begin to watch Griffith films is that increasingly the acting becomes much more naturalistic. Right? He really had a way of getting really good acting out of his actors, uh, the Gish sisters being amongst the, the more famous uh, actors that worked with him. Um, and, and there were plenty of other people that, that made their way through uh, Fort Lee over the years uh, in, in these studios. And then many of them uh, later went out to uh, Hollywood as, as well. Uh, Theda Barris started uh, right. in Fort Lee, in the Fox Studios. Um, even the Marx Brothers' first film was actually done at Fort Lee. It doesn't exist anymore, right? Right. right. Unfortunately. Right. But like a lot of those early motion pictures, they're all gone. Right? Yeah. But um, there are some left now. And you right. can actually see a lot of these if you go to YouTube. Yeah, uh, you can see a lot of these early motion pictures. Today. And Max Sennett as well, right? Yeah, Max, Max Sennett, Sennett was there, started right? as an actor, yeah, that's right? right? Started as a few well, films. yeah, in fact, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, and then and and it was it was the directors, and then eventually the actors sort of become right. the 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 image on the film becomes what people think about first, right? right with motion pictures, but it takes right. a long time to get yeah. from those early motion pictures to the screen celebrities of the 1920s, right? Right. Uh, and, and you can sort of see this emerging with the creation of United Artists in 1919. So D.W. Griffith director, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and Charlie Chaplin formed the studio, right? And that really marks the shift, right? Now motion pictures is gonna be driven by the artists. Right. And that's really where that shift happens. And in the 20s, that's what you see, right? Is the, the artists take over. Now what is happening in the same time period back in Europe? Are they still doing as much inventiveness as they were doing before? And is that growing as well? 
as in America? Right. Well, the film industry is very international in its early years, and one of the reasons for that is it's silent. Right. Right. Language doesn't matter, and that's one of the huge differences that happens right in the late twenties when sound gets introduced, and all of a sudden, all of these languages, you know, it's foreign films become real foreign films, right? right. Um, uh, it's surprising. Edison himself, who was trying to develop motion pictures with sound from the beginning, in fact, in 1913, he goes back to this idea and actually tries using large cylinder phonographs linked mechanically to the first the camera and then to the projector uh, to show motion pictures, and it fails because it just get, keeps getting out of right. sync. So, but by the time motion pictures comes into being sound pictures in the late 20s, Edison is almost deaf by that time, and suddenly couldn't enjoy it right. and wanted the old silence because he could appreciate that without having to hear the voices. Right? Uh, but by 1918, and again, I don't know whether it was because of his interest or financially or what was going on, he decides just to right. abandon it? And right. Well, the, by, the, by the teens, of course, you, uh, Edison during the war wasn't very much at home. He was actually been doing a lot of research for the Navy in right. those years and doing a lot of traveling. Uh, other people were running the business. Um, when he came back, um, uh, I think that there was a sense that the motion picture industry wasn't a core industry for the Edison interests. Mm -hmm. And in part because they hadn't really moved into uh, developing the long story art form as well as some of the other companies that were led by um, these artists like Griffith and Charlie Chaplin mm -hmm. and Max Sennett and others. Right. And I think there was a sense that they had sort of fallen behind. And so when the offer was made to pie them out, they took the offer. Right. Right. So in looking at Thomas Edison and the um, history of film, mm -hmm. it's um, fascinating to know that he was involved in so much of what I would call the foundation that then right. the movie industry grew on. Right. Um, is there something that you feel that maybe has been overlooked about Thomas Edison about the motion picture um, development that maybe you want to say or? Well, I think one of the interesting things about Edison and motion pictures is that it's one of the few inventions where Edison didn't have a clear sense of the market. Right. Right? Here's this guy who's very attuned to the marketplace and he never quite really understood where motion pictures fit in. Right. And Edison thought about it as a technology. So the Edison Film Company was Edison, actually the Edison Manufacturing Company, which manufactured other things. Uh, fans and x-ray equipment and things like this and they manufactured the cameras and the kinetoscopes and later the projectors and that's what Edison thought the business was was selling the equipment and having movies to show in them but it was right. really the equipment where he'd make the money but as it turns out he was wrong about that right. it was really the movies that mattered. Well he was right about so many other things I think we can excuse him right. <laughs> for maybe missing. Right. He, wasn't, he wasn't right on everything. Right. right. He did have a few successes during right. his life. Is there, <laughs> is there a, because he lived till 1931? Right. Do you know, because now that you brought, brought up this point, was there ever a regret on his part? Like is there a quote or something that he said, you know what, I should have stuck with that because by 1931, I mean the whole industry had grown and changed. Well, I don't think Edison ever kind of regretted. He, Edison was never that personally involved in the motion picture industry. Right. Right. Um, he had other people who ran that business. I, mean, I think there were other industries that he was more heavily invested right. in personally than motion pictures. I think it was, it's one of these fascinating things where Edison saw a problem to solve, figured out how to solve it, and then other people kind of took it and really made it into what we know right. today as the movie right. industry, right? Well, again, thank you very, very My much pleasure. for coming here. Learned so much about Thomas Edison and the film industry, and I want to thank you again. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Classic Movies with Ron McCluskey, and we'll see you next time.